to begin with today is just by setting the bar really high. <laughs> when you realize that in this story that uh, Lauren's talking about, one man, when he was given a Bible and told that this Bible is good for every area of life, th thank God for the man who gave him the Bible and said it that way and didn't just say it's good for your own salvation, right? But the, the, I want you to see that one Bible in the hands of one person, he had to learn to read, right? Had to learn to read. Then he had to devote himself to it. And because of the way it was introduced to him, he actually did study it and read it looking at all areas of life. And over his lifetime, producing those 40 books on all of those different subjects. And it really is phenomenal that one man, again, went all over Norway walking or on skis because there wasn't the freedom of movement. And into every household, he tried to visit personally every household. Norway was his parish in that sense. That was the level of responsibility he felt. But he did it one household at a time teaching them to read and then equipping them to read it in such a way that they would see how it transforms every layer of society. That is phenomenal. And, and I want to set the bar high to help you see that really the power of the Word of God can transform nations. Okay? The Word of God throughout history has had this kind of impact. All right, very, very significant, of course, the, the Methodist revival, John Wesley in England. Very, very significant key reason why the UK did not go the same way as France. France did not have a reformation. France did not have um, the kind of uh, impact of the word of God. And so their bloody revolution <laughs> goes on for a long time. <laughs> and destroys incredible number of lives, whereas the UK had a, not perfect, but it, it definitely prevented the nation from going the way of, of, uh, of France, right? And we've seen the Word of God have this kind of impact again and again and again. A, a very um, significant story for me has been just the life of one man, John Woolman, a uh, Quaker. And uh, uh, he was living in Pennsylvania. And uh, as he waited on God and read the word, he was significantly convicted that uh, slavery uh, was wrong. And uh, he was a, a notary, a public, he, he owned a store. And he also, um, so he had like a little mom and pop store that we have, you know, sold sundry goods. And he was also, um, a notary public, so whenever somebody needed some legal services, all right, he would be the one they would bring those legal papers to and he would notarize them to make them legal and official documents. And uh, when the Quakers were coming, would come to him in his town and want to leave their will and document and notarize their will, he would speak to them about the slaves that they were leaving in their will to the next generation. And God convicted him personally about not, um, through the word of God, about not um, uh, being um, a party to that sin. And so he would persuade, he would ask questions and he would persuade from the word of God, encouraging one by one people not to leave slaves to the next generation, but to free their slaves. And to not just free their slaves, but to free their slaves in such a way that they spent some of their children's inheritance to make things right. <laughs> By ju not just releasing the slaves, but helping set the slaves up in business. And journey with them until they were actually fully functioning and restored in their businesses. And this one man, because of the impact of the word of God in his life in this way, he... In some ways, he had a horse. He didn't have to walk and go on skis. He had a horse. <laughs> he went all over the United States to Quaker home after Quaker home after Quaker home. And 100 years before the, the American Civil War, all right, which was, what, 1850s, 60s, 
A hundred years before, 1760, slavery was obliterated. Slavery was non-existent amongst Quakers in the United States. And they had not only set the slaves free, they had set them up in businesses and been patrons with them and invested money to see the lives and family life, not just economic life, but family life of these people restored because of their sense of responsibility to that. that, that that's the word of God that transforms nations. Okay? It's the word of God that transforms nations. And uh, those are two very different examples in the sense that you've got one man. He, he, he um, didn't have one life message. He had the whole Bible. <laughs> and he taught the whole Bible and he discipled for the whole Bible. And his books were on all areas of society. John Woolman had one life message primarily. He, he had other messages too, but the, the most significant life message was this one against slavery. But he also was used by God to disciple a nation. If he could have had a ministry that went to the whole nation instead of just the Quakers, think how many hundreds of thousands of lives could have been saved with the Civil War. It's a high calling we have as a preacher and teacher. But it's also an incredibly exciting one. Because Peter, Jay, you're going to the Orang Asli. This book can transform their culture. Right? Robin, as you're preaching to Nepalis, your nation, already there's been significant change over the last 50 years. <laughs> Incredible change in the nation, but there's a lot more we need to see, right? And uh, this book can transform your nation. Robert, China, right? As one man, if you can go, or train others as one person to go, home by home, what can happen in terms of the transformation of that nation? When we see North Korea open up, Mi Jung, <laughs> right? When we saw, see North Korea open up, we, we need the word of God in there to transform that nation, right? Celio, I don't know if there's one nation God's given you or if he's going to send you to many nations. We're going to use you primarily for training and equipping others to go to the nations. But either way, the power of God to transform the nations is phenomenal, Right? It's phenomenal. The, what's that? The continent. The continent. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> Robert, you take China. Celio, you take Africa. <laughs> right? <laughs> but in order for this to happen, we need to pay close attention to our teaching. Okay? We obviously have to be people of character. We have to be letting the Word of God transform our own lives. But we also need to be skilled in the Word of God. Okay? Workmen approved, who need not be ashamed, rightly handling the Word of truth. Okay? And so this is what we're going to be uh, looking at. Um, I highly recommend this book. If you don't have it, it's been... Um, Jody, there's been, this has been re-released, right, under another title? Do you know the other title? This came first, and I don't have uh, the newer title. Um, okay. Yeah, the book that transforms nations, I, and you may find it under another title. Um, but it's well, well worth it. The power, power of the Bible to change any country. Uh, Discipling Nations, the Power of Truth to Transform Cultures by Dara Miller. I highly recommend it. Um, and then uh, Vishal Mangawadi. I just love saying his name. It just kind of trips over your tongue, Mangalwadi, you know. Vishal Mangalwadi. That's <laughs> a cool name. <laughs> yeah, he is. Um, um, he's written another book called Truth and Transformation that I strongly recommend. He's addressing the whole issue again of uh, the Bible's power to transform nations. Um, this little book, The Legacy of William Carey, and the, A Model for Transformation of Culture, it's also by Vishal, and um, 
it's a very easy and enjoyable read. It's, you can read it in a couple of hours. It's um, not, not brain crunching like some others. But what he does is he just walks through sphere by sphere, uh, even right at the beginning in terms of the impact of William Carey, uh, Christian missionary and botanist, industrialist, economist, medical humanitarian, media pioneer, agriculturalist, translator and educator, astronomer, library pioneer, forest conservationist, crusader for women's rights, public servant, moral reformer, cultural transformer. He was another man, like, um, like, like, like our gentleman whose name is escaping me because I couldn't pronounce it well to begin with. Um, William Carey was not well educated. Right? He didn't come from a long tradition of literacy. He was a cobbler. But he got literacy where he needed it. And he was very well educated, actually. And he um, went on from there to learn about every area of life. He, he, he was a very passionate learner. And he brought the Bible to bear on every area he could touch. And... Uh, Vishal Mangalwadi makes the bold statement to say really that modern India owes all the found, its foundations to William Carey, which is a very, very bold statement by an Indian man. So I encourage you to, uh, to read those books, get those books and read those books and have it inspire you to how much God can do one other example from history. This is a man named Girolamo Savonarola. And he liked to eat spaghetti. All right, he was born in 1452 in Ferrara, Italy. He was sens a sensitive and serious boy who was enamored with the study of religion. He started training as a physician, but his idealism caused him to drop out and to join the Dominican order to fight the evils of the world. He transferred to the convent of San Marco in Florence in 1482 and rose to the position of prior. Savonarola was deeply distressed by the corruption within the Catholic Church and what he saw as a lack of piety among its leaders. He spent his time fast, praying, fasting, and teaching the novice monks. By 1491, he had become famous as a preacher. The primary themes of his sermons, and so here you see his life messages, primary themes of his sermons were God's pending judgment and the need for repentance. He also preached against the worldliness of the clergy, the evils of the ruling class, and the general corruption of secular living. His criticisms of the ruling class made Savonarola, in effect, the spiritual leader of the Democratic Party when it came to power in Florence in 1494. He gained additional popularity when he succeeded in convincing the French king to give up occupation of the city after he had conquered it. Savonarola used his power and popularity to bring about reform of the church and state. He's considered to be one of the early reformers of the Catholic Church. Although he didn't disagree with the... Okay, blah, blah, that part's okay. He became a virtual dictator over Florence, and under his leadership, it underwent a startling transformation. Businessmen restored ill-gotten gains. There's transformation for you. Where do you ever hear of that? <laughs> there was much Bible reading, and the churches were crowded. At the same time, Savonarola made many enemies, especially within the clergy. The Pope hated him because he openly condemned the Pope's character and practices and did not acknowledge his authority. He was summoned to Rome, but he refused to go. The Pope... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I actually have great respect for the Pope. <laughs> The Pope then commanded him to discontinue all his preaching. Savonarola obeyed this for a while and spent his time studying. However, during this time, 
When he was supposed to be inactive, he succeeded in turning a usually riotous annual carnival into a time of giving to the poor and singing hymns in the street. Next, the Pope attempted to gain control over Savonarola by ordering the monastery of San Marco to be incorporated into a new grouping of convents. Savonarola defied the order. His spiritual influence over Florence was so strong that during the carnival season in 1497, children gathered in decent books and pictures and made a bonfire of them in the main square while singing hymns. This bonfire of vanities was an affront to many of the city's moderates. With the passage of time, community support for Savonarola's strict views started to wane, and his power began to erode. The Pope sensed the changing heart of the people towards Savonarola and decided to make the most of it. He was excommunicated on the grounds that he had disobeyed the Pope's commands. The Pope ordered Florence to silence Savonarola or send him to Rome for trial. The fickle public abandoned him as the city government changed hands. He was never actually the governor, right? He was the spiritual, kind of the spiritual influence behind the governor. The new government arrested Savonarola in April of 1498, he was tried for sedition and heresy and was brutally tortured. He was publicly hanged and his body burned. In the succeeding years, the majority of cit citizens of Florence went back to their old ways, yet many permanently changed. One of those was a sculptor named Michelangelo. That was very interesting. We see God disciple cities. We can see him disciple nations. This is God's heart. And that transformation usually comes one person at a time. Right? But it is God's heart and his desire. All right. We said before that we're called to enter the teaching ministry of God the Father and of Jesus. It helps us to recognize that there really is power for us in this because our God is a teaching God, okay? We're not trying to do something that he's not good at. Our God is by nature a teacher and a disciple, and he's been doing it from the beginning. So um, let me have a few people look up some of these verses, and we can read them. Isaiah 48, 17 to 19. Can you look that one up, Robert? They're, they're right here on your sheet, oh, right. so just put a little tick by the one you need to look up. If you can look up that one. Um, uh, Celio, if you can look up um, John, uh, sorry, uh, Isaiah 50, verse, verses 4 and 5. Robin, John 14, 10. This one here. Uh, Mi Jung. Let me give this. Ed, uh, John 7, 14 to 18. Uh, Mi Jung, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. And uh, Peter, uh, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. So just find your things first so that everybody's got them and then we can all focus. Oh, just look up at me when you you've got them. Everybody got them? Got it? Found it already? Found your references? Okay. Go ahead, Robert. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like the sand, and your descendants like its grains. Their name would never be cut off or destroyed from before me. Great, thank you. That's, um, what, what translation is that? ESV. ESV, okay. Teaches you, does it say, for your profit, is it? 
I like, I'll just read this, that two, one, two, pe- prophet. two prophet, that's interesting. Um, I am the Lord your God who teaches you for your own good. That's what the, R- the new RSV says, teaches you for your own, go- own good. So I think the profiting isn't, it's not talking about money there, okay? It's talking about, it, it's, God teaches you so that you will profit by it, you will do well, and who leads you in the way that you should go. Um, uh, Celia, Isaiah 50. The suffering Lord has taught me what to say, so that I can strike the weary. Weary. Yeah. Weary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every morning it makes me eager to hear what he is going to teach me. The Lord has given me understanding, and I have not rebelled. Oh, turn away from him. Great. Thank you. This is, here you see that God gives, this is, this is one of the servant songs, this passage in Isaiah. So we've just seen a little earlier, God is the one, God the Father, he's the one who teaches us for our own good. And then it's here, the Lord has given me. The me, you can trace it, in fact, you may enjoy doing that as a part of your own Bible study through Isaiah, the second half of Isaiah, and see where me refers to, and it's, it's God talking about himself, and the Lord has given me, it's talking about the servant who's coming, Jesus. So it's referring to Jesus, the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. This is Jesus' teaching ministry, all right? And you get a a glimpse into what the life of Jesus with the Father is going to look like. Morning by morning, he awakens me. He wakens my ear to listen as those who are being taught. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious and did not turn back. This is Jesus with the Father as a, in the incarnation, (laughs) being taught by God the Father how to speak and what to say. Um, 14.10, is that yours, uh, Robin? John 14.10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who deals in me does has work. Isn't that great? I love that passage. It's, it's, it goes so nicely with what we just see in Isaiah. All right. The Father is in me. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. And you get this interrelationship of Jesus with the Father and that the words are coming from the Father. The Father's the one that teaches Jesus. He gives him understanding, right? They, were, they marveled that Jesus could teach the scribes, right? Even as a young man. And so here we see that the Father is interacting. This is when we're called into the ministry of Jesus, which is what we're called to as preachers and teachers. It's not our ministry. It's not our teaching ministry. It's the Father's ministry that he's given to Jesus, that Jesus gives to us. Right? And the good news is, is that Jesus promises to give the Holy Spirit to us in the same way to take from the Father. He says the Spirit will take from the Father and make it known to us in the same way as he would teach Jesus, right? We're called into the ministry of Jesus, and we are equipped by him to do that. Um, John uh, 7, 14 to 18. Uh, About the middle of the feast, that Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews and therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learned when he has never studied? Mm. So Jesus answered him, My teaching is not mine, but a his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. 
but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. All right, that's very significant. What, what do we learn about our ability to hear from God based on our motives in that verse? Yeah. If, if we really desire to do God's will and our desire is to glorify Him, it does something in our ability to hear from God. Right? If we're about wanting to look good, right, in the process, if it's, if it's about us, and I, I think it's true that even just because we all come to God with mixed motives, I mean, I think that's okay to say. You see, even Paul talk about as you trace his motives for preaching. You know, there's many motives. There's the, he has motives of, of um, uh, fear of judgment <laughs> because God's given him a responsibility. So he has that as a motive. But he also has the love of Christ compelling him as a motive. All right? And so there's, there's, there's a number of things in there. that, are, And we, we come to God and, with mixed motives. None of us come with absolutely pure motives. And I think we should just put that out on the table and be relieved by that. God, is a, God will purify our motives as we go. Actually, persecution, suffering, difficulty, the hard work of it all, uh, the delayed response, the kind of patience it takes to see fruit, all of those things will purify our motives. Okay? Um, and we need to, to know that and stay in the game and let our motives be purified. To, to want to see God's glory in it. But the more we do stay in the game and see our motives purified, the better we will be at being able to discern what God is saying and to proclaim his message. All right? So that's an encouragement to us. Jesus, um, he had an unblocked motive. His motive was uh, to do the Father's will. For us, the more we press in to do God's will, the more we will be able to hear his voice and enter into his ministry. All right, 2 uh, Corinthians 5, 20. We are there for Christ's uh, ambassador, as you know, by our nation is up here through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. He can reconcile us. All right, and so you see... Paul, taking very seriously, right? We are messengers of God. Paul was very serious that he wasn't proclaiming himself. He was, gonna, he was proclaiming God's message as God's spokesperson, as if God himself is making his appeal through me. All right? This is um, the kind of um, authority God wants us to have in our teaching. And there's something very significant in this process, especially with inductive teaching. And you're going to be learning this with expository preaching next week. And it's part of what makes expository preaching very powerful is that you keep coming back to what God is saying. You're not speaking and saying what I think. And if there's an argument and you're preaching difficult messages, and there's a lot of difficult messages in this book, this book must be confronting us right? For change. And if it isn't confronting us for change, we're not hearing God's words because that would mean that we're the pinnacle of what God wants as we are right now. And that would be a very sorry state of, thing, of affairs, right? So, but somebody's argument as we're preaching expositorily is with God and his word, if we're doing it right, right? We're his messengers, it's not with us. It's, if you want to argue, argue with what God is saying. You may reject him. It's not about rejecting me. It's rejecting his word. But God is making his appeal. And Paul took that very, very seriously. That's why I still believe expository preaching is one of the most powerful. Um, and it's one of the least utilized, it seems like, today. Everybody's preaching the inspirational message Okay, that rules the day today, the inspirational message, the prophetic message. I'm for the gifts of the Spirit. 
grown up in a charismatic church. I'm grateful for the gifts of the Spirit. But we must have the Word of God or we're in big trouble. All right? We need all of the works of God, the evangelical, the charismatic, the holiness, the social justice, the, justice, the missions. We need to see a move of God that's transforming all of these areas. Historically, it's actually Bible schools that have fueled the modern missions movement, not seminaries. I mean, seminaries have been debating whether the Word of God is really the Word of God. You know, so a lot of people go to seminary and struggle to believe the Word of God after that, actually. Right? But Bible schools teach that the Word of God is the Word of God and then actually spend the time here. And so this should encourage you. All right? You don't need to have gone to seminary. You need to be a student of the Word of God. And the Word of God transforms our lives and we're to be speaking this. This is our authority. It's no excuse for being sloppy in our thinking or not being a good student of the word because Paul says to pay attention to your teaching. We must pay serious attention to our teaching, but that's not the same thing as needing to go to seminary. All right, it's being diligent uh, to hear God in the word. And we'll talk about that a bit more. All right, uh, last, Peter. Yeah. Peter, reading Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, verse 10. Each of you has been blessed with one of, one of God's many wonderful gifts to be used in the service of others. So use your gift well. If you have the gift of speaking, preach God's message. If you have the gift of, gift of helping others, do it with the strength that God supplies. Excellent. I love that verse. In the, in the RSV, uh, new RSV here it says... Um, if you've given the gift of preaching, preach as one speaking the very words of God. I like that particular translation. Sorry? Uh, the new RSV. Speak as one preaching the very words of God. Yes, like good stewards. This is our calling. <laughs> And if we will embrace this and recognize this really is the ministry of Jesus and we really are called and equipped into it and the Spirit of God is sufficient. Good reading skills are necessary. Good study skills are necessary. But um, it's the ministry of Jesus. We're called to it and he will give us all that we need in order to see that task fulfilled and fulfilled well. Okay, let's take a short break and we'll come back and do a bit more detailed study. When you're going to be teaching and preaching on a regular basis, you need to stay in the whole Bible. And the thing that's nice about, and, you, and you've got to decide how you're going to do that. All right? Because obviously you can't be studying the whole, in SBS you're studying the whole Bible every year. And maybe if you're doing it full time, if you're teaching and preaching full time, you can do that. All right? Because your, your lifestyle is different. Okay? When you're teaching and preaching all the time, it's much easier to organize your lifestyle around study. It gets challenging when you're not teaching and preaching all the time and you're teaching and preaching once a week and carrying kawan, right? And involved in this school and this ministry and this ministry, right? You've actually, it, it's hard work and you need to make some very deliberate decisions about how are you going to do this so that you, you stay fresh in the word of God to pay close attention to your teaching. I found I, I, I've struggled some over the last few years. There's been times I, I actually didn't want to teach. I didn't want to preach. And this is the first time teaching in, 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 quite, in, several, in about three years in terms of just really teaching. I've done preaching but I, because my world was so immersed in needing to learn all about learning disabilities <laughs> and issues for John. Yes, devotionally, I was in the Word, but I could find myself up preaching, and it's in my notes. I've prepared, I've studied, I've prayed, I've prepared, I've got my notes, but you're teaching, and an illustration, something comes, and you want to pull this in. It's appropriate now. It's not in your notes, but I could get the facts wrong. 
because I hadn't been in it's a, an illustration out of Chronicles or something, and I hadn't been in Chronicles probably for seven years. <laughs> okay. Because I hadn't been reading the whole Bible. I'd been, during that time, devotionally and reading parts, but I hadn't just been systematically through the whole Bible. And actually, if we're going to be deliberately teaching and preaching, and that really is a season, what God's called you to, I encourage you, you need to read the whole Bible, and you need to find ways to do that. You either have to do that just devotionally, do a through the Bible in a year reading, okay? Um, another way, actually, if you're, um, you need your time to study, but you've got to stay familiar with the whole Bible, and this actually used to help me until I just, over these last few years, I, um, it's really just been about the year and a half, I transferred this responsibility to Rick um, of taking my kids. I was always doing my kids' devotions. So I was doing Bible study with the kids. And so even if, and I had a, a, a through-the-year Bible, children's Bible, but a very good one, an excellent one, not these, you know, ones. It, she really, Mary Batchelor is the author, and she's, um, she does a brilliant job handling the Word of God for kids, and she covers the stories well. She doesn't just cover the few biggies. <laughs> it's an excellent children's Bible, and I would find that helped me, actually, because we would actually go through that two or three times a year, <laughs> that, that children's Bible. It just kept all of the stories and names and facts and dates fresh when because of the particular season of life, this has been what, uh, for me, a time of isolation these last few years. Um, in focused lives, that's, one, that's a, a period sometimes in people's lives that God, there's, there's isolation times, and God uses them for different situations. I'm still figuring out all of what he's using mine for. But, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, it, in this season, reading through children's Bible regularly, a good one, will help you. And I often encourage that in a situation like um, uh, Robert's talking about, in, and this could work for you in working with the Orang Asli, it could also work if you have a good children's Bible with the Nepalis, okay? Um, uh, this is called The Children's Bible in 365 Days by Mary Batchelor. It can really help you when you don't necessarily have an overview of the whole Bible yet. I often encourage people to, to have to a good children's Bible, and this is the main one that I recommend, and actually read through that first to really get a good overview and a sense of how the timeline works, and then come back in and study. But for you, most of you know you've studied, you've done SBS, then you've just got to find a way to stay fresh. And it's not, a, not for study right there. It's just reading the whole Bible so you just are getting the whole counsel of God and uh, you don't end up becoming what um, uh, started to... I started to get pegged as the, the preacher for migrant ministries. And the only time I'd ever get called to preach was to preach on migrant ministries. Well, I'm not even preaching the Bible there hardly. You know, and that's, that's miserable. You know, and I love migrant ministries. I'm thrilled to be preaching on why we should be reaching the migrants. But the body of Christ needs the whole message, the whole word of God. So I encourage you to find a way to read the whole Bible, just a read, Bible reading scheme. Three chapters, three to four chapters a day, systematically will take you through the Bible in a year. You can use a one-year Bible, which will do little readings in the New Testament, in the Old, in the New, and in the Psalms. I personally don't like those very much because I hate reading in little chunks like that. But um, a good friend of mine, Susan Allen, she does that regularly, and she handles the Word of God fabulously. And she's, just, she's not done an SBS, but she is a student of the Word and does it consistently, year in and year out. Does that devotionally and then does other Bible study on top of it um, because it doesn't take long to do that kind of just reading the Bible devotionally, three chapters, four chapters. Do that at night. Do your other study in the morning. Do it at lunch. Just do it somewhere. Fit it in. It doesn't actually take long. Or listen to it. 
which is a very good way that Ed is very good at. Use the audio Bibles. And actually, if you've got, if you've been more recently in it yourself and then you go to audio, it's easier than if there's a longer gap, right? Um, because it's, it's fresher there. But that is, is another excellent way to do it, to just make sure you're hearing the Word of God regularly. And it's, it's helpful. You want to mix these ways, all right? So it can be very helpful. Um, uh, I discovered this some years back in SBS where I learned something um, from the Bible because the way Rick read it is different than the way I read it. I've got my intonations. I, I, I like out loud reading. You know, I'm a, I like that kind of thing. And so, you know, I've read it and I hear my voice and it's kind of, you know, I put the emphasis here and there. And when you hear somebody else read it in an audio, a good reader, a good Bible reader, does a lot of the exposition for you. Understanding comes when somebody who understands the book reads it well, out loud. And it's very, very helpful. So these are some good things. Find ways to get a high degree of word intake, okay, that isn't somebody else teaching the book. That has another place, but you, you've just got to be a student of the word yourself. All right. Otherwise, you'll get caught up in the winds of doctrine and what everybody's teaching this month. Okay, so it's very important to be um, to pay close attention to your teaching that you get the whole Bible on a regular basis. Use children's Bibles. Use audio books. Use through the Bible in a year different reading guides. Okay, so that's one thing at, at, at the most basic level you need to commit to. Okay, to guard your teaching. We, we've, got to, we've got to listen to God well. If our message is his message, we need to listen to him. There's just no way around it. Okay. Um, uh, second point here is inductive Bible study. You, you do need to continue to find ways to build inductive Bible study in. Now, if you are doing Bible reading all the way th through, and that, that's something that you commit to, over, over the years, and I encourage that. Then when you're coming and you're preparing, you're going to prepare a Bible study. You're preparing a preaching. Do you guys teach, do you teach systematically through the Bible in the Nepalese, or how do you decide what you're going to teach? So you go between systematically teaching through a book and then do some topical issues that need to be addressed and then do some other books of the Bible. So that's great. So when you're teaching, I don't know how you're doing it. Are you using a discipleship book with the Orang Asli or are you teaching through a book of the Bible? Are you using topical teachings? Chronological. Chronological. Chronologically, I picked some story. Genesis, Genesis to the, uh, they just... Story. Okay, so you're doing it storying through. And how are you doing yours? Picked up, touching some topical subjects. Okay, you're d and how, do you, how are you deciding those topics? Uh, like, no God, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, something like that. Do you have a discipleship book that you're going, working through? And who produces that? Uh, International Christian Mission. International Christian Missions. Okay, good. I'd be interested to, to take a look at that. You've got to find ways to continue to build inductive study, okay, so that you're doing your whole reading and that you do some kind of um, study. There's a few different ways that you can do it um, uh, for inductive studies, and I you might want to just write some of these down, but um, uh, or you can kind of tick some of them off the list. The Nav Press Bible Studies. Those are, um, are excellent. Um, it's from the Navigators. They're excellent Bible expositors. They teach um, studying book by book and studying inductively. Um, they have some excellent things there. Um, N.T. Wright, he can be controversial a little bit um, in the body of Christ, uh, primarily because of one or two things in the, the way he handles um, in Romans. 
But overall, his studies are incredible. His Bible studies are phenomenal. I feel like in terms of just learning and gaining understanding, he's also very good at application. Um, I've learned more from him um, than, than anybody else teaching on a book. Um, so uh, N.T. Wright and his work. Um, so just get, a, just get a book of the Bible, his study guide for Matthew and spend a month in Matthew. Read the book, read, read, and then uh, read the book of Matthew, and then just go through it afresh. Um, so those are, those are good things. So to study inductively, to study passages inductively, you'll have a focus on that, okay, for expository preaching. Okay, you want to continue to make sure, because preaching Preaching reverses, right? The methods of preaching actually in a lot of ways reverses inductive study, right? When you're going to preach, you preach and your, your whole hook and your whole presentation focuses on the answer. What, what should be learned, the main application from that passage. So you preach backwards from, your, from inductive study. But it's easy to forget to study inductively when, you get, when you're preaching, okay? Because you've if you don't do it that way, it's easy to start with that and then just build your message that way instead of going back into the text. So you've got to study inductively, and then from that, you're going to pull the main message that you're hearing from God that, that's coming out of the text and the main application, and then you start with that and you build backwards into your message, okay? And, uh, and you'll learn that. All right, theme studies. Theme studies um, can be inductive. And this is something that over the last few years um, I have done more of. I've tended to always study book by book, but over the last few years um, I've gone through well, in this Bible and a couple of other Bibles and just studied the love of God through the Bible. I just wanted to see everywhere and use it to read through the whole Bible and just read everywhere that the love of God is talked about and expressed. Studying with master teachers. It's important. Sometimes you can find, um, well, the reality is, is outside of SBS, most of the, the great teaching input I've gotten has come from dead guys. <laughs> dead guys. They're living. With heaven, yes, they're living with God, but they're dead. <laughs> Come from books. I mean, I wish there were just magnificent expository preachers today, but there aren't many. N.T. Wright, to me, is one who's fantastic. I really do like Timothy Keller. Um, I like Timothy Keller a lot. Um, I do like um, uh, Mark Driscoll. Um, I don't like everything of Mark Driscoll's, but uh, there's some things that he really handles the word well. He's, there's some immaturity in, in character that he's suffered from um, a few scandals recently. They're, they're not ones that are going to take him down, but they're just immaturity ones, things, like, like the writing situation I talked about. And we've been listening to um, uh, Mark Driscoll's sermons on the Ten Commandments. And they're fantastic. One of them nails himself in a recent scandal that he's just had, but um, I'm sure he's feeling the pain of that. Um, uh, but fantastic teaching, really handling the Word of God well. And he's got a great media guy who does a nice intro to the Ten Commandments, but just handles the text very, very well. And it's I've really enjoyed it because in SBS, I tended to teach the Ten Commandments from the perspective of um, the thou shalt, the opposite in the sense, um, understanding the, how far God calls us to go with the Ten Commandments, which it would be great for the, for the Dutch Reformed churches. They need to hear that message um, of uh, a, much, a life-giving way of handling the Ten Commandments, but... Um, he preaches it just addressing the thou shalt nots, and it's really, it's really appropriate today and really hits core, core issues that are infiltrating the church. So that you've got to hear, find good teachers and get input. 
it's not, you're still doing, still at least reading through the whole Bible, okay? And then do Bible study with these guys. Study the Ten Commandments with somebody who's a good teacher. There's so many good resources in terms of podcasts now. That's what I have to say if you uh, want to listen to the best apologist. Apologist? Uh, yes. Yeah. He's brilliant. Sure. Ravi? Another good Indian. Yeah. I, I, you're right. He is, I think he is the best apologist globally today. And th- there are some really excellent ones, but he is brilliant. Brilliant. So. Um, I do encourage you to um, to go on Vishal Mangawadi's site. <laughs> Mangawadi. <laughs> um, and then some of the others we just said, uh, Timothy Keller. Um, Mark Driscoll, like I said, he's been in the news a little bit, but it, mostly on immaturity things, rather than. Uh, John Piper. John Piper. The, the nice thing is uh, they have a very good website, and basically everything in audio or MP3, yep. you can search on a scripture or a topic, so that one is very, and Other Joe McCarter, I don't always like it, but the, the nice thing is he went through the whole New Testament, I think in 30 years. And that way he uh, on each verse. Mm-hmm. Good. Are there other favorites that you found to be really excellent Bible expositors today? Yeah, I, I really like it. I don't agree with everything he says, but even the stuff we, I don't agree with, I really like how he says it. It's so clear. It's so fun if only he would be gracious to the whole body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's his one thing which is a shame for me. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a lot of foolishness in the charismatic movement. I can understand he, his frustration with it, but you know, the Pentecostal movement around the world has been phenomenal. But yes, he, you're right. He definitely handles the word of God well. In other ways, he has tremendous strengths, and we should listen to the whole body of Christ and listen to his teaching gift because he has a lot to offer. But remember, in all of these, whatever your people you're listening to, pay attention to your teaching. You've got to be in the word for yourself first. Okay? So that is absolutely essential. Good. Anybody else you would add? No? Alistair, how do you spell his last name? R.C. Sprawl? Yes. Yes. Good. So add these to your list. Okay? Add these to your list. Um, take online or other Bible courses. You may, that's, that's another way, all right, to stay fresh in the Word. Um, like I said, for me, for years, I actually didn't go to any outside sources. I really was just, there was so much for me just in the Word myself. And that's, that's been a real shift these last three years for me. Has been a big shift to getting input from other sources. And I think it's just that season in my life and a lot of the apologists. Um, a lot from the apologists. So um, the seasons, times and seasons, but 
We just got to find ways to stay in the word of God. All right? And then I made this other note here that if teaching isn't your primary gifting, right, the, 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 the bigger your teaching gift, the more original study and time in the Word you've got to spend. I mean, there's just no doubt about that, okay? Because um, the bigger the building, the wider and deeper the foundation's got to be. Um, but, um, and I think Peter's um, making good use of this study I, that, that he's talking about using for the discipleship, um, working with Yorang Asli. Is you, it's, it's good to use somebody else who you, can, who you know and respect and teach their, teach their stuff. But be a student of it first, right? You've got to go through it as if you're doing the Bible study fresh and new with them before you teach it, all right? So that it's living, okay? You've got to, it's always got to be living, Okay? And, um, and so that's certainly, the, there is a time and a, and a place for that. And there have been some times over these last couple of years, I have preached uh, N.T. Wright's um, stuff just because it was so good. <laughs> but I've introduced him on the slide first <laughs> and, uh, and preached, let people know that this is his message because it's just living, right? living message.